Hello, everybody, and welcome to this month's episode of Financial Transformation Live. Um, so again, this this live is being streamed on both LinkedIn, YouTube, and I think we're being brave enough to venture out into Twitter as well. Um, but if you have missed it, of course, do remember we do publish the episodes um, on demand and you can access it um, via our website. I shall put the link on now um, and you get an opportunity to sign up to the latest session as well so any um if uh, anyone doesn't have a chance or thinks that their um their colleagues could do with having a quick look at this then please do feel free to recommend it on so these sessions are designed to be practical hands-on pieces of the puzzle that comes with financial transformation um, and each month we pick a topic we focus in on it and we do a presentation and or guide on how we approach it when we're implementing so so let's get cracking. Um, so what are we going to cover today? So the first, so we are going to cover what a good chart of accounts looks like. So chart of accounts is one of these topics that either in most cases and shivers down people's spine, but it's actually when you go into a new business, it's one of the first things you look at. So um, if you're listening to this live, um, please do say hello. Um, and um, but if you have ever seen a chart of accounts that makes you recall in, ho holler, in horror, I should say, um, then, you know, um, <laughs> clap your hands, tell us, um, tell us about it, because it is such a common problem. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about how that problem occurs, why it happens, and almost how, how do we start um, afresh, and how do we build a chart of accounts that is future as future-proofed as possible? Now, you'll notice the caveat in that as well. So we'll talk about, um, you know, when is the point we need to think about what you're doing? Um, so we're going to talk about what does a good chart of accounts look like? Um, we're going to talk about the key signs that you need to think about redesigning your chart of accounts. Um, I'm actually going to take you through a basic framework. Um, so I think that is one of the things that um, people don't have is a process to go through when they're um, when they're designing their chart of accounts. So we're going to cover that and I'm going to give you some top tips. So um, so hoping you guys are all with me. Hello. Thanks for saying hi on the chat. Um, so hi, Simon. Um, so please do um, keep your comments, your thoughts, your questions coming through. Part of what we want to do here at um, Financial Transformation Live, CFO 4.0, and obviously with the team at ITAS is to build a community of people going through transformation because sometimes it can feel like you're on your own and you're not. You know, finance is changing dramatically. Transformation is one of the biggest um, shifts that is happening. And in order for finance to thrive, we need these skills embedded within our finance teams, which is why we are doing this session. So quick heads up for those eager beavers that want to join us on the next session. So the next one we're going to be doing is all about breaking the year end stress cycle. So if you happened to um, have had a particularly stressful year end process, maybe you're just coming out of it, which is from the conversations uh, with a few um, finance teams and CFOs, that's what's happening at the moment. Um, if you are, then please do um, join our next session. We, I, and actually one of the things that we're keen to get is, um, is your inputs. So um, if you um, have been, or I've or just been through year end, um, or even if you haven't, and it was back in January, um, we're actually putting out a year end survey. So I'm gonna pop the link in the chat. Um, and if um, you guys want to attend, obviously the next session, uh, the link um, and the download link and the next session link is on the, um, is on the, the screen now. You'll see at the bottom, there's a link to our website. We'll pop the link to the um, to the next session and we'll pop the link to the survey in um, and we'll share the results. So please, we want as many people as we can to share um, their, 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 um, their assessment of how year end works, what the challenges are, so we can make that, that session as productive as possible. So hello, we've got quite a few people now joining us. Wonderful. So we've got I'm going to I'm going to apologize in advance for any pronounce your names. <laughs> um, I'm uh, I'm terrible with reading names, but Azizel, lovely to see you. Akmal and Kashaf, wonderful to have you with us. So, OK, so let's actually get started with today's session and let's get some learning in. 
So um, for those of you that haven't joined um, one of these sessions before, um, my name is Hannah Monroe. I am MD and Transformation Lead at ITAS. So I've actually been working um, on transformation projects for well over 10 years now. Um, and one of the things I've seen both um, obviously out in customers and actually weirdly enough with other consultants is a lack of proper framework around how things are thought about. So I want to share some of the tools that I use and I have used um, across the years to drive this transformation. Um, you know, we are a say we are basically a transformation consultancy that specialize in Sage technologies. So we work with the Sage range, everything from Sage 50 to Sage 200 and Sage Intact. But this particular episode, I have one slide that gives you some guidance if you're using a Sage product, but everything else is product agnostic. And that's really important to me that you can come away from these sessions with some practical um, tips and tricks to approach it. So, so let's start with what does a good chart of accounts look like? So a good chart of accounts. So um, it, it's really hard is that you, I tend to know by looking at one, what, you know, whether we've got a conversation to have about redesigning on a, on a project or, or whether it's, um, whether it's, a, it's going to do the job. So, um, so the first thing we're looking for is, is it flexible? So is it meeting, the, is it able to, to meet the needs of your stakeholders, right? And, and I think one of the challenges is people see the chart of accounts as only being required for finance, and it's really, really not. Um, so all of your management reporting, all of your regulatory reporting, and actually your internal departmental and operational reporting very often is driven from the, the the chart of accounts. So it's really important that we we understand that and we take that into account. So can it meet the needs of multiple stakeholders and their reporting requirements? Is it scalable? Now, again, um, hands up, give a little round of applause, give a little thumbs up if you've ever seen a chart of accounts that is huge, right? So they've got masses of lines. Um, it very often happens when people are trying to twist and morph their existing systems to do a particular job so they might have extended out with a a nominal for every project that they've ever worked on or every fund they ever worked on um, and and that is a real challenge right so it the, whatever chart of accounts you build has to be scalable because otherwise in a year's time when you come to year end it is likely you're going to have to rebuild it so again um, I'll talk to you about how you need to think about that and I'll give you some top tips and tricks for how you can find alternative ways to address the reporting requirement while still building a scalable chart of accounts. <laughs> yeah, you would have seen a few of these over the years. So um, it, it is so common, right? And, and I think it comes back to um, a, a lack of um, understanding of the challenges behind that kind of setup. The third thing is consistency, right? If you look at a chart of accounts and there's no consistent numbering, no consistency of labeling, no consistency as to what you are using, either dimensions or departments, across whatever is your structure for, then you have a challenge. And that very much comes to, you get this higgledy-piggledy um, approach um, when, when you actually go to build. And the challenge with that is very often it's hard to report on. Um, very often you'll get mistakes around postings and things. So we're looking for consistency. Is it clear? Well maintained. Yeah, Akmal, I completely agree with you. That is my face. <laughs> well, actually, I've got pretty good at the poker face. I go into and I see it, I go, right, we, we're going to sit down and we're going to have a conversation about this chart of accounts, right? We're going to think about how we future-proof it. Um, but yes, I completely agree with you there, Akmal. Um, Well-maintained, another key element. So you need to maintain and review your chart of accounts, um, at least on an annual basis, but you need to monitor how things are working, where postings are going, and somebody needs to take responsibility with an organization for it. Um, compliance, obviously, right? So, um, you, you do need to make sure that it, it, it works for whatever legislation your company happens to be sitting to um, or can produce reports in the format that you need it for. Obviously, depending on whether you have a French or German entity, there's some interesting things that are required over there. But, you know, that's what we're looking for and easily used. Right. So um, you need to if you need to give somebody a detailed guide on how to use your chart of accounts, then it's probably not designed in the best possible way. OK, so it needs to be 
easy for the system to identify where to post things. Um, you want it to be as automatic as possible. And so you need to think about how you're structuring your chart of accounts in order to support that. OK, so that's what good looks like. This is what we're aiming for. Flexible, scalable, consistent, well-maintained, compliant and easily used. Right. That is the dream. So what are some of the signs that perhaps we need to rethink? So if you're struggling to produce individual business unit reporting, or they are asking, are constantly asking you to export transactional detail, then you need to rethink, e well, at the very least you need to consider rethinking your chart of accounts. You may decide that actually it's, it's a conversation about your systems, but at the same time, there are there probably are things you can do with your, your COA to, to actually deal with it. If you are spending all of your time pulling your TB into Excel and trying to remap into reporting groupings, because that is the only way you can pull a basic p and um, then again, we probably have to take a step back and rethink. I, you know, and those that know me will know that I'm not a fan of using Excel for reporting. For me, it's an absolute last resort. Um, but um, again, you should be able to do a comparative to your p and for quick reconciliation purposes um, in your system as well as outside. And, and if you can't do that at a minimum, then there's probably an issue with either your setup in your system or your chart accounts. Um, we talked about this before, but, you know, pulling, if, if you're spending, if all your team are spending their time exporting transactional data and trying to build the, you know, the lookups and uh, pivot tables off that data, then again, we need to have a rethink. Um, if you are noticing consistent and repeated mispostings that you are having to correct, if um, individuals are struggling to know where to post things, then there is something not quite right. So, you know, um, identification of where to post should be driven either by the system or it should be really easy for people to, to know where to post elements. So you just need to you need to understand if that's an education piece or, you know, um, or if it's a structure piece. And what generally what I find is some is it can sometimes be in between, but a good chart of accounts makes it easy to identify. So you've got good descriptions, good nominal numbering structures that support well, you know, um, easy posting of um, elements, even journals. Um, if you have no space, so um, to add new accounts, um, so, you know, we talked about maintaining, there are times where you need to add new accounts, it shouldn't be on a regular basis, if you're doing that, you're do not quite doing something right, um, but you should not be adding new nominal accounts all the time, but if things are randomly ordered, or you've got no space, then it's probably something wrong. And if you aren't able to meet your regulatory requirements and you're having to go again back to literally audit trails to pull out data, then again, these, you know, any one of these could be a sign. If you have every single one on this um, PowerPoint, then yes, you definitely need to re <laughs> rethink your nominal. Um, but again, without being too general, here are some of the things you might want to consider. Okay. So there's a basic framework and a thought process that I go through when I'm designing a chart of accounts, right? So the first thing is requirements, okay? So identify the requirements. I also need to understand the system capabilities. If you are designing your chart of accounts with no understanding of how your system can use, um, can design a chart of accounts, and or what functionality is available across the wider system, then you're not going to design the most efficient um, process possible. And that's tend to be, it's this part that a lot of people forget. They design the chart of accounts they want, um, and, um, and then they, but they don't actually spend time, one, understanding the requirements, two, or two, understanding system capabilities, right? So the third step then is building and modeling, which is the bit that most people get. So once they get step one and step two, we're all right. Um, but there's a few hints and tips that I'll give you as part of that process that you might want to bear in mind. And then, of course, number four is implementing and number five is maintaining. You've got to have that feedback loop. You've got to be, con you know, consistently aware of what you're doing. So, OK, so those are the that's the five steps that I go through um, either mentally or with the team to actually understand um, what we're doing um, and how we are going to design a chart of accounts that works for a customer. So the step one, identifying requirements. So the three minimum, and this is minimum, okay, there are kind of three minimum things that you need to get requirements for, right? So 
you need to think um, about your management accounting pack. You need to understand how you're grouping, um, how you're, what is the lowest level of detail that you go to on a line level. Um, and you need to understand your regulatory reporting, whether you've got covenants that require things in a certain format, whether you've got legal reporting, which is either legislation specific or, um, you know, other, other, you know, maybe you're part of a industry that's highly regulated, you need to work within a certain boundaries. Um, you know, charities have a very different structure to obviously in terms of a chart of accounts normally to a standard setup. Um, business unit reporting as well. So this again, this is where some very often um, finance teams fall down is they don't actually go out and speak to the wider business about what they want. They assume that what they're delivering is is sufficient, okay? And then things like COVID hit and requirements change and or requirements are no longer fit for purpose. So um, your, um, so those are the kind of the minimum areas that, or the minimum focus areas that I would work on. Now, there, there may be other requirements that are required. Again, depends on your, your business and your business type, but that's the minimum. And then for each of those, you need to understand what you have now. So what is the reporting you're currently producing? Um, what is it that you anticipate you might need in the next um, 18 to 36 months? Um, and of that report, how do you want to slice, dice and drill down? Okay, so people forget to ask the drill down. If they just want to go to transactional data, then that's doable. Um, but actually, um, you need to make sure you're really understanding the requirement, even get them to map it out or give you a little spreadsheet with what they'd like to see. Um, and you, you kind of want to visualize it if you can at all possible. So that which is easy if you've got existing reporting, not quite as easy if um, you're doing more of a blue sky exercise with the team. So, so thinking about all those things. Um, and the reason this is the first step, so a lot of people will build a chart of accounts first and work their way back. So they'll take a template, which is can be used, and I'll tell you when you should uh, compare against a, an example chart of accounts, but not at this first stage. Before you build backwards when it comes to a chart of accounts, the first question is, how do I want to display this information? What do I want to report on? And everything else follows. Okay. So step one, figure out your requirements, particularly focused on reporting. OK, now, step two, and again, this is an area that people don't quite go wrong on, is they'll design the chart of accounts before they've understood their, their system capabilities. And there are lots of things that as a consultant, when I'm working with a particular piece of technology, I know kind of the pros and cons of doing things in certain ways. But if I just give you a guide for the sorts of questions that you should be asking of your technology provider, whether that's zero, whether that's... Um, QuickBooks, whether that's Sage, um, regardless of what system you're using, you need to get these kind of this information as a minimum. So the first thing is, what are the chart of account structure capabilities? So very often there will be hidden ways to structure um, either your chart of accounts, etc., cetera, um, that um, allows you to extend its capabilities. So you might have the option for group accounts or sub accounts or um, a numbering sequences that allow you to do like dashes. So, you know, you need to ask how many numbers can I have in my chart of accounts? Because then that gives you opportunities to, to, to make it bigger, but also to create more space. Can I have alphanumeric? Can I have, is it purely numbers? What options do I have? Um, you may also have additional like codes um, and dimensions in that chart of accounts, right? So for instance, if we work with, and I'll, I'll, I'll go through some of the Sage products, but for instance, Intax is multidimensional, um, uh, Sage 200 has a three tin um, structure. So depending on which system we're working with, we would design a chart of accounts in a different way. So that you need to understand what are all the possible ways um, that you could structure the chart of accounts. What are the tools in your chart of accounts toolkit, right? Um, whether that's an analysis code somewhere. Um, so you need to get to the bottom of that. The second piece is you need to understand is what are any limitations about um, how you can use that, those structures. So um, for instance, when you in a certain reporting tool, how does it group and, um, you know, how does it group that data? How do, does it use um, 
reporting groups? Does it use the account number? Does it use a, a and other, maybe a class or something like that? So again, depending on your system, you need to understand that chart of account structure capabilities in line with the reporting tools within the system. Okay. Now you could extend that and again, pull it out into Excel, but you, I always think that you need an equivalent PL to reconcile against when it comes to generating financial statements in particular. Okay. Um, and then you need to think about is that outside of my chart of accounts, how else can I meet the reporting requirements that have been put forward? So classic example is customer profitability reporting. Very few nominal um, or charts of accounts allow you to access customer information in the ledger. You know, of the, you know, Intact does, for example, which is one of the products we work with, but Sage 50 doesn't have that necessarily have that level of detail sitting in the ledger. So when you're trying to understand profitability, coding at that level can be quite challenging. So you need to understand what are the reporting capabilities that sit within that system outside of your charter accounts that might help you meet the, the needs that you've gathered, those reporting requirements. Um, and the last piece, and again, a piece a lot of people forget is they will spend an inordinate amount of time designing this beautiful chart of accounts, but the logic behind how it selects the, the nominal is, 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 needs, is overly manual, right? So it's not defaulted from a stock item or a customer or what have you, or they can't achieve what they need to achieve, right? So what that then means is your reliance on individuals to select the right chart of accounts in the first place, which again, um, adds human error into the conversation. We all know that we are human, we do make mistakes. So and that is something that you need to avoid. Um, the other thing which I haven't got on here is understanding inputs and outputs. So for each piece of reporting that you're looking to place in terms of slicing and dicing, how are you going to get that data into the right chart of accounts? Because there can very often be limitations. Um, and, I, and I thought, you know, and whilst I don't want this session to be about Sage, um, I thought I'd use the three different products that Sage have in terms of Sage 50, Sage 200 and Intact from a, to talk about these four elements, right? So, but the principles um, and these questions are things you should ask of your existing software provider, right? So whether that's zero QuickBooks, whatever it is that you're using. So, so for example, if we look at the chart of account structure across the three, so um, Sage 50 does actually give you a pre-built out of the box chart of accounts, right? What a lot of people don't know is that you can actually start from scratch. Um, it actually uses account ranges to group on your PL. Okay. So when you're designing your numbering structure, you need to leave space. You really, really need to leave space and you need to be clear about where those ranges are hitting. Um, I think off the top of my head, it's four digits. I don't think we have any stretch on that. Um, but you can build custom lines on the PL layouts. Again, another mystery. So, um, and it does have a consolidation option, but it only consolidates balances, right? So, so those are the restrictions that I would be working in when I'm designing my chart of accounts. Um, and I also have departments that I can tag transactions on. Okay, if I'm shifting up the track, I know with 200, I actually be looking quite differently. So I have a three tier nominal, I know I have an account code, a cost center and department. Um, standard p &L layouts, they group by reporting category. So, so, you know, that's where I need to make sure I've got my groupings nailed. It actually has no relation, weirdly enough, to the numbering, which gives me a lot more flexibility. Um, and I also know that every single combination of accounts, cost and department is theoretically a different nominal. OK, so again, that gives me some flexibility in how I build out my reporting structures. Um, I also know that there is a nominal analysis code period. So if piece, so if I'm looking to pull out some weird and wonderful reporting that doesn't quite fit in line with my standard management accounts, I know that I can do some other groupings with those analysis codes and pull information out in that way. Um, and I know that I have both a custom and an automated consolidation, which actually goes to two tiers um, when I consolidate. I can make three, but it's a little bit messy. Um, um, and less automated, okay? And I know that I can have a different chart of accounts per company. Personally, I don't like that. I think it causes confusion, especially in multi, you know, big acquisition groups and big groups of entities, but you could think about it. So what I'm doing here is not um, trying not, you know, not to advertise, obviously, um, I'm 
these features as a as a wow look at this but it's actually about understanding the limitations of the software that you're looking at right so um, and if we go to intact completely different way of working right it's multi-dimensional so you post a transaction the customer the project stock item all goes into the nominal so you can imagine the size of the chart of accounts, the complexity of the chart accounts changes really dramatically as we go through each of those different phases. OK, so this is your first question is what capabilities do I have with play with? And make sure you are somebody that genuinely knows what they're talking about, because um, if you speak to somebody who's used 50 for years, they will often tell you that you have to use a standard chart of accounts. I've heard it um occasion you know on occasion and i actually went to our consultants and asked the question and actually it's amazing what will come back if you speak to somebody that actually knows the the technical capabilities of the software so that is my first shout out before you start designing get an understanding of what you can play with the second thing is to think about where else you can get this reporting from so project reporting is a classic so the amount of times i've seen chart of accounts where they have combination of nominals per project or um and where they have a three-tier nominal um they might even have account like a group of accounts per project and it is just horrendous right and it expands and it's not scalable because very often once you post to a, a nominal account you can't deactivate it because it's got history so then you have to you know you have to then reset every three to every three years because you've just created this monster so genuinely um, really think about is this a chart of accounts reporting conversation or is this somewhere else so projects modules are a classic across all systems and you can see the different projects options we've got across 50 200 and intact even with projects it will there are differences in the level of reporting and detail you can get and the one caveat and the one question you need to ask yourself is how do I correct it if I've missed posted to a project because that is where 50 for instance is a bit weaker than say something like 200 or intact because we can journal to a project so do thoroughly examine those capabilities if you're going down the project route basic customer and costing reports are very often able to be produced within um, within the ledgers, within either your sales order processing or your invoicing module or even your sales ledger, um, because very often there'll be custom fields, for instance, on a customer or a supplier or a stock item that you can use to then get out, for instance, business units or source and things like that. So just just don't limit yourself once you've got your reporting requirements, don't limit yourself to your chart of accounts. Um, and then you need to understand your reporting tools. Again, for those that are interested, I've put the ones that are available in 50, 200 and intact. And then you need to figure out how you select nominals. The, the first question you ask is, can I overwrite it? And you need to verify every single entry point and transaction. So if I'm entering a purchase order, creating an invoice, um, anything, you know, can you have the ability to override the default? Because that obviously gives you an option. It's just about education. Are they entering it right? But more importantly, what you want to understand is how you can default, because if you can default, you remove, <laughs> um, you know, Joe blogs in sales from selecting the wrong account and you having to correct and that being challenging, et cetera. So, again, making sure that you've got data right and defaults in place wherever possible is really important. OK, so. I'm hoping you guys are still with me because we are getting into technical detail. Um, I'm not going to spend any more time on um, software specific stuff. But for those that are interested in more of a Sage 50, Sage 200 intact, I'm, I'm actually working on a document that gives you this in a lot more detail. There's only so much information I can put on a on a PowerPoint. So if you would like that, please um, put a little yes, please in the chat. Um, and I will um, will add your names to a list um, and DM you when it's available or we'll you know, send you a link and you can sign up and download it. So if you're if you're working with any of those three and you'd like to have this uh, this list of capabilities, then let us know. OK, but um, and so the other thing to think about, so I'm just trying to remember last time I worked with a customer that was using zero so zero has a projects module um, i don't believe it integrates with the um the the chart of accounts so again you've got to make sure you can get that separate piece out um there is um 
I think they have some, I can't remember how they pull um, the structures in, um, but I do believe they have departments and things as well. So apologies. Um, um, if you are desperate to know what Zero can do, let me know. I do have a, a few friends over the fence working on transformation projects of Zero. I will pick their brains. Um, so yeah, so um, if you if you want Zero, you need to write Zero, please. And I'll do my very best to get some information. And uh, well done. Thank you, Sophie. Um, she's going to put, she's put on a link if you want to request it. But for those that have already commented, we will send that through. Okay. So step one, going back, um, is understand reporting, get a good idea, engage with all of your stakeholders, um, and make sure that you're, you've got a clear idea of what the output is. You know, you start with the end goal in mind. It's true for a lot of projects, and it's especially true for your chart accounts. Step two is make sure you know inside and out what your system can do. Grab a chat with somebody technical, speak to your support team, whatever it is. Get an idea of all of the options that are available to you. Um, so step three is building a model. So this is the bit where pe most people, to be honest, this is where most people start, okay? Which is, well, and they'll, they'll tend to do it in a couple of ways. So most people will take their existing one and see what they can chop out, okay? And there, there is a place for that. It depends how good your existing one is. Um, but very often, the way I structure is I start with my reporting. So I think about all of the lines on my P&L and I build those out. And then I, um, and I do the same with balance sheet. Um, and then I start to model, okay? And then I'll do some things like some gap analysis. So what I would suggest you do, especially if this is your first time redesigning a chart account, is put together some example use cases that you need to model. So it could be a project report, you know, um, it could be a fund report, it could be a SOFA report, P, you know, standard P&L across departments, whatever it is, um, just put together almost like a list of all the outputs. Um, and for each of those reports, make sure you know what the inputs are. So how are you entering data into that? So is it an invoice? Is it a journal? How are you getting that data in so you can assess the um, the, the input areas? Um, make sure that you know that and all of the inputs that you need can be coded at the right level. So again, um, projects is a common example of this. So if you are going to pull projects out of your p &L, which you should personally, right? Um, that's one of the big ones. Um, then you need to make sure you can code um, cost, revenue, and do adjustments in the projects module to suit what you're trying to achieve. Um, create a test company, right? Which may seem really obvious, but it's amazing how many people don't do this, okay? So um, create a test company, set up some basic reports, take a copy, and then enter some data and actually see the reports. So enter some example and actually get some example transactions and post and see what's happening, okay? Because that will allow you to test not only your reporting and your structures, but it allows you to attest to your defaults, okay? Um, and the reason we take a copy before is that if for whatever reason you need to make one small adjustment, you can start again with that freshly designed chart of accounts um, and take a take two okay especially if you don't do this for a living because it's hard you know um it can it can make even us consultants think yeah and um, building out chart accounts and trying to think about how that's going to appear so you know um that's a really good way especially if it's either your first time or you've got some weird and wonderful reporting requirements it just gives you an opportunity to really sense check everything um then I do a gap analysis. <laughs> so then what I'll do is I'll take, um, I'll take it, to be honest, I do two gap analysis. So I'll think about what does your existing one like and have I got the mapping? And I'll, and there's a reason for that later, which you'll see. Um, you know, have I missed anything? Um, and then the, um, the next option is then to do it with an example chart of accounts. Now, very often there will be an industry specific example, because for instance, a subscription based business would have a very different chart of accounts to a not for profit, for example, or a sand business, right? If you're stuck stage 50 as an out of the box one, that's always a great starting point. If you're using stage 50 for charities, there's an NFP version. Um, again, we are going to be pulling out some example charts of accounts for different industries. So again, if you'd like that, um, pop in a little note um, and we'll, we'll we'll do our best to feed this back, you know, depending if there's, if there's hundreds of you, then I might need to put a link out, but um, let us know. And, you know, if it's useful, we will share it because again, this is all about helping you guys enable yourselves to do this work. So, um, so we've done our gap analysis, we've compared against our existing chart of accounts, and we've compared against an example chart of accounts, 
just to make sure we've missed it, nothing, right? And then the big question you need to ask yourself is, um, am I overcomplicating what I'm doing, right? If you have to explain to somebody how you've put together your Excel reporting on the back of this, i.e. I take the first two digits of that one, I take the last three digits of the explanation and that's how I've got my report, there is something really, really wrong. So either you've not designed the chart accounts well or your system is not fit for purpose, okay? And you don't have the right finance tool for the job. Um, and which is a really hard conversation to have. I've had to have it occasionally. Um, I always try and work within the systems that I've got when I'm given a project, but very, very often, um, well, very often, um, very, pretty, actually, no, I would say very often when I've seen horrendous charts of accounts, it's because either somebody's gone crazy or they've not followed this process that I'm talking about, or it's because um, they've not got the right um, system. So if you get all the way through, you've done a really good job of understanding requirements, of understanding your system capabilities, and you still end up with an absolute mahoosive chart of accounts that needs constant maintenance. Um, and uh, yeah, um, Zach Ma will say, um, and I'm sure will agree with me that you you are you actually going to have to stay, stay, take a step back and either change your reporting requirements and have that very frank conversation with the wider stakeholders, or you're going to have to review what you're doing. Okay. So a um, couple of ones I just want to point out. So um, there's always the odd um, account that slips through the nets. This is again why I suggest doing those two gap analyses, you know, just to make sure you've ticked all the boxes. Um, suspense, people forget about, um, you need one in there. <laughs> there is going to be stuff that goes wrong or miss posting, especially if you're trying some neat logic. So make sure that you've got it in there. Um, remember your interco on both sides. Most people are pretty good at the interco on the balance sheet. Sometimes they forget what's happening if they're selling into company products on the PL. Um, exchange differences, really common one. Bank charges, really common one for people to forget. Um, you need to think about how you're managing your bank accounts. I always suggest, if possible, a different nominal per bank account. Um, but you need to think about that in terms of how that setup is going to work. Um, and then your basic control accounts, like are you going to have different debtors and creditors accounts? If so, how do you default that logic? So as you can end up in a mess, um, your tax defaults, all those kind of things. So just make sure you've ticked all these boxes, which I'm sure you will if you've done a proper gap analysis. But don't forget these ones. OK, so we're doing all right for time, guys, um, but I am going to have to speed up as I'm not sure I'm going to get through everything. So step four is the implementation side. So prepare your mappings and your splits before you attempt migration. So what do I mean by that? So when you migrate um, and you start afresh, you're going to have to import your opening balances. Do not on the day you're migrating your opening balances, have your start doing your mappings. Okay. So firstly, um, if this is a really great opportunity to understand um, if you've missed anything. It's like, it's almost like a, a third gap analysis, right? You're just checking to make sure you know where everything's going. Um, if you suddenly find that actually you've split what was one account into two, you are gonna have to figure out how you're going to split that. And that may not be an easy conversation or an easy calculation, okay? So you will need time to do it. So the ones you're looking for, the easy ones are when you're going, you know, from one either one to one or two to one right so when you're you're consolidating two accounts into one that's that tends to be easier from a mapping perspective your warning flags and your red flag needs to go up when you're going from one one account in your old chart of accounts to two accounts in your new one you are going to need to think about how you're going to split that out for reporting purposes um so prepare your migration and mappings before check for the ratios. Am I going one to one, two to one or one to two? It's the one to twos that are the problem. Um, so that's that needs to happen well before your your sort of migration date. The second thing you need to think about is how much history to migrate. Um, if, a, you know, at all costs, you want to avoid transactional migration. I have never had anyone I've spoken to, and you know, this isn't us doing migration, but having spoken to people who have been through this kind of migration, whether it's by a tool, whether it's um, by 
a, um, you know, by a consultant or by imports and exports that have said, oh, wow, that was super nice and super easy, right? Transactional migration is incredibly challenging, especially when you're changing your chart of accounts, right? Because it, it has all sorts of impacts. So you want to pull across the minimum amount of information to achieve your goals, okay? So you might say that actually my minimum goal is I need to be able to pull a P&L this year versus last year. Great, okay. Do you need to do it on a month by month basis? Yes, okay. So our minimum goal is month by month nominal movement, yeah, which I'm gonna which I'm going to prepare my mappings and I'm going to start preparing my history, you know, historical data before I go live because I can map last year out because I've closed the year, okay? Um, but I'm not going to go any further than that. If you're going any further than that, um, I think the only exception I would sometimes recommend is dimensional migration. So where you've got like within tax, when we post an invoice, for instance, it goes in against a, a, a customer and a product. So for reporting purposes, if you need to understand customer profitability year on year, we don't have a choice. We have to take that. But you do need to challenge. OK, so people, if you give them the option, say, do you want all of that history or do you want some of it? They will go. I want all of it. It's just natural instinct. OK, so you you need to qualify the need for the history. And like I said, avoid transactional migration at absolute cost. Um, and if and the only type of transactional migration should be opening balance items on your creditors and debtors. And just remember, if you're doing that, to think about those, whether you've got separate creditors and debtors accounts and reconciling that. OK, so that's just a tip. OK. Don't forget to configure your defaults and settings, okay? So um, there is nothing worse than posting uh, a day's worth of transactions, looking at your suspense account and seeing everything go to a suspense. So do a quick triple check of all your settings. So have you updated the default nominal codes on your stock codes, your customer codes, your supplier codes, and in any of the settings within your system, remembering that you should know what those settings are because you've done all of your logic. Remember, as part of phase two system requirements, we've gone through how the, how the logic works. Um, and then, and I, and I, I all jokes aside, monitor your spends incredibly carefully because if you're going to see issues, you'll normally see it within the first day or so. Don't leave it to your first month end to get this whole shed load of suspense postings. Um, keep an eye on it from like literally within the first few hours, the earlier catch it, the easier it is to translate and fix. Um, and not just suspense, right? So I do say suspense is the big one, but look at where things are posting. Is it picking up the right departments, transaction codes, dimensions, whatever it is, keep an eye on it, right? So, and if you, and that's why I say that testing period is really, really valuable. Okay. Um, maintain. Okay. So once you're live, right, you're happy, your reporting's great, wonderful, you've redesigned. Um, think about within your team, who is going to take responsibility for maintaining it? So have, you know, obviously random checks around um, where things are posting, which you pretty much should be doing and you should be comfortable with. Um, maintaining how new customers, suppliers and stock items are set up and we're picking up the right nominals. Um, if you're going to add, you kind of need to really, really qualify what you're adding, okay? Um, because you shouldn't need to add if you if you future proofed. There are a few exceptions to that, of course, maybe a new line of business or something like that. But wherever possible, you want to avoid adding new accounts, and actually, the focus should be on departments or projects or whatever other mechanisms you're using for your reporting. Um, how when you go through this process document the reasons because it's really hard looking back to think about why you've done things right it should be pretty obvious um again we go back to clear consistent um charts of accounts easy to use it should be there are exceptions to this rule um whereby we need a short-term fix where we need to build something a bit more complex for reporting purposes to get us over a six-month period while we look at new systems or what have you um, and in that case, just make sure you're documenting why you're making those weird and wonderful choices, because then you can rationalize it out um, and try to leave space. Even when you're adding new accounts, try to leave space if you have the option. OK, and again, that's why it's really important to know what is your maximum in terms of um, size of um, chart of accounts. And if your chart of accounts is really tight to begin with, the first question I ask is, can I have an extra couple of digits? Can I have six instead of four? Because then that allows you to redo that. Oh, and one tip I didn't tell you, when you're doing your numbering, do your numbering last. 
Okay, so build out all of your chart of accounts, give rough numbers, but then go back through, design your entire chart of accounts and then do your number and sequences. Don't try and do it from the beginning because then you end up redoing it like five times. So it's just not worth it. Okay, um, so that's maintain. Okay, that's it. So we're at the end of our, um, our five steps. So, um, so top tips. So you'll have to excuse my, um, my spelling on this slide. Um, if you spot it, <laughs> you can have a good giggle. Um, I'm using a template, as you can tell. Um, but the top tips are, so firstly, do not create a monster, right? Um, if you I feel like you're creating a monster and you just want somebody to give you an eye over it, just send me a screenshot, right? I'll tell you straight away. Um, do not create a monster because either you or somebody's going to have to unpick it, right? And really, really challenge hard on actually creating that. If somebody gives you a monster, challenge hard, okay? Because um, again, chart of accounts is one of those things that is hard to change because you've got to do all the migration and reset and think about historical data and reporting. You don't want to keep doing it. And um, every time I see a monster within 12 months, it gets redone because it's just too hard to maintain and or manage. So please, please avoid that at all costs. Um, when you're thinking about your chart of accounts, try and think about the structures as being used for one thing. There are exceptions, right? But generally, a department should be used for one thing. A cost center should be used for one thing. Don't, you know, a dimension, if you're using dimensions, it should be used and appropriate for one thing. Don't try and do departments and projects in the same, you know, in the same column or the same depart in, um, in the department entity, right? So you just need to be, just try and keep it simple, right? When in doubt, keep your chart of account simple. Um, if you're constantly adding accounts, you're doing something wrong. There is something not quite right. You're either using your chart of accounts or something it shouldn't be, um, or you've not built your structure out well in the first place. Um, you've missed something. Um, your nominal accounts, the way I think about it is it should be the lowest level that you want to drill to on your PL and balance sheet. So that's why I say ask the drill through question, because if they say down to individual transactions, gravy if they say i need to be able to see for instance marketing i need to be able to drill down on my digital ads and see ppc um linkedin um you know google ads etc then you need to think about that structure and how you're building it out now you may be able to use dimensions if you've got supply dimension you may be able to use products depending on what software you're using but that's why you need to ask that drill through question um and don't build a chart of accounts for this year okay really, really try and think ahead about and think about if you were going to stretch this PL, where how would you do it? If you had to add new product lines, how would you do it? If you had to add um, new departments, could you do it? New business lines, new business units, all of those things that you think you might be asked for, build it for that. Because invariably, if you think you will, at some point, somebody will ask you for it. Um, so that's really important. Okay. So I am keeping an eye on the chat. I haven't had any questions. Um, what are we thinking so far? It, please, please, guys, if you do have questions, then ask. You know, I do want this to be an open session. I'm throwing a huge amount of information at you. Um, and I know sometimes this can be a little bit overwhelming. Um, on the um, on the web page, you you know we'll upload a copy of um, the PowerPoint minus my spelling mistake. Um, but um, so if you want to get this, I this this um, PowerPoint in particular, I have actually crammed quite a bit of information on because I'm kind of hoping that if um, someone is doing this, then um, they 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 might need a bit more information than usual. I, I tend to talk as you um, you might have guessed. Um, but one of the interesting things, right, is that. Designing a chart of accounts is so, it can be incredibly strategic. So it's, you know, and um, people ask who should design. And for me, it's a cross between your FC and your CFO or FD, right? It's at that level. It sh it's not normally a junior task that this would go. In. And certainly it needs running past at least those individuals before it goes out. So that's just one thing. I think even Deloitte, they did a report on um, chart of accounts um, and they were saying that it's a CFO piece. Like it, even for the largest organizations, your chart of account structure can make or break your reporting. So you really need to, to get it right um, when you're building out. Okay, so let's recap. Identify requirements, understand capabilities, build and model, implement, and then maintain. Sounds simple when you put it like that, doesn't it? But um, you'd be amazed at how many people struggle. 
So if you do have any questions, um, I am going to keep an eye on the chat now for the next couple of minutes. Um, and while you're typing those out, um, then I'm just going to give you a few other bits and pieces to ponder on. So one of the things I would love to is to do is get some ideas for topics, because um, a lot of them are based on conversations that I'm having either with customers or prospects that are speaking to us around things that are a challenge and and or things that people need to do before they um, they get to a point where, you know, they need us. So um, if you have any ideas for topics, um, maybe there's something um, that you would like us to cover that isn't on this list, then please pop it in the chat. Like I'm genuinely open to ideas because the, I'd rather this came, this is value. I'd rather this be valuable to you guys um, and actually um, get help you in some way. If there's anything on this list that you particularly would like me to do and prioritize, again, pop it in the chat. I'm more than happy to um, to take take you up on that and, and bring some stuff forwards because it's kind of what I feel like covering and or based on what I've had a conversation with somebody about. So really open to ideas, new thoughts, new ideas. And also if somebody wants me to prioritize something because that's something they're actually working on, then let me know. Um, so current suggestions, is it the process or the system doing an internal review of your finance system? Um, calculating and communicating ROI is hard, right? So we talked about that and how do you do it? Um, designing and planning software integrations, because I do a lot of that. Um, so that was one of the ones that came up and putting together requirements documents. Like I've seen, I've been, I've been on the receiving end of a lot of requirements documents. Um, so, and all, you know, helped the old person prepare them as well in a past life. Um, so actually there are some, you know, I've seen good ones and bad ones. So I was going to do a session on how do you put it together, maybe with some examples that people can use. So um, if any of those um, um, sound interesting and or if there's anything else you want to cover, pop it in the chat, happy to pick it up. Okay. So again, I mentioned this last time, but we are hoping to launch a new format um, when I get back from holiday, which is going to be in a couple of weeks, which is basically doing sort of Q&A sessions. So if anyone has a, is particularly interested in having a live Q&A and asking me loads of questions about whether that's Sage specific, general transformation, no project, planning, chart counts, um, then feel free. I'm happy to do some live workshops. We just, as long as you're, ha it's basically up to an hour. Um, as long as you're happy for me to record the session, um, then I'm happy to, to, to offer my services for free if you'd like. Um, and then the next session, as I mentioned earlier, is the break in the year end stress cycle. So, um, Sophie has very kindly um, earlier on in the session posted the year end survey. So if you guys have found the session valuable and or you want to attend that breaking the year end stress cycle or want to help others, then please, please, please fill out that survey. We're going to use that to structure the content for the next session. So, um, um, you know, we're happy for it to be anonymous. If you guys want to receive a copy of the recording and the live, you can pop your email address in. But generally, we just want to know what you want us to cover in that session. Um, and plus go through some hints and tips based on experience. And then content. So for those that are interested um, and either have or haven't heard of Intact, we're actually going to go through what a multidimensional nominal is. It's a new cons, like it's pretty new. Um, a lot of the um, accounting software out there still uses the old three-tier nominal structure. You know, we work with software that still does. Um, but um, Intact has this, and I, I love it, from a reporting perp, um um, purposes. This is amazing. So yeah, so if you're interested, I'm going to be doing a webinar on how that works, why it's different and what you can do with it. Um, for those that didn't catch this last time, we've got the getting started guide to streamlining your processes. And for those um, do, you know, do remember, um, for those that um, are interested as well, remember, we offered to put um, send out sort of a sage guides on the different um, criteria. So just put your comment in the chat if you want that or if you want zero pop that in and I'll do some research and come back to you um, and then last um, we've already we've got an on-demand webinar on getting rid of spreadsheets which came out of um, the last few sessions that we've done um, if you want to sign up to the next session which is year breaking the year end stress cycle because we all need to 
wouldn't it be lovely if year end was just the same as another month end? And if, if your month end is as bad as your year end or is still pretty, pretty bad, then definitely go back to um, one of our old session, which is about reducing your month end close time. There's a whole piece about how you map out your month end tips and tricks for reducing it down. Um, the last session we did was all about process free engineering. So if you haven't caught that, you can get access to that. Um, and breaking the Excel addiction was one of the first FT lives that I actually did. Um, and it's still very, very true. So it takes you through how to do an Excel audit um, and how to actually change the behavior, the habit behavior that comes with using Excel. All of these are available on the web, on our ITAS Solutions website. Go to www.itassolutions.co.uk financial dash transformation dash live the link if you see it is in purple at the bottom of the screen so please do check it out um and yeah if you've got any questions let me know um thank you very much for the suggestion around um decision making with regards to continuing with an existing erp or implementing a new one i think that might tie in really nicely to the session i was thinking about doing about evaluating your existing system and where's the break point because there's always an interesting conversation about do you just do enough to give you space to implement a new system? Because so we can maybe have a chat with that and that'll either be a separate session or I'll tie it into the evaluating your existing one. But that's a great topic. Thank you very much for that. Um, brilliant. OK, so we are now at the end of the session. I really, really hope you found it helpful. If you have found it helpful, would love it if um, if you can leave a comment, um, send me a message. Um, and you know any feedback you've got. So think something you think we could do better, then please do let me know. I'm always open to suggestions. You know that whole continuous improvement mindset that we have here at ITAS. Um, and of course, if you you know if you found this valuable, please just tell you know a couple of people because a lot of what this do is about spreading the knowledge in the community. You know, in finance, it's really really important that we um, that we we help each other to develop and that we build these skills into day-to-day -day finance rather than it being the realm of us consultants. So thank you so much. My contact details are on there. If you um, want to ask me a direct question, if I get enough questions, I will actually do a follow-up session. So if you want to um, send me through any questions you have, I'm happy to do sort of a, a live, a live QA based on feedback, you know, whether it's related to this one or another financial transformation live, more than happy to do that. So thanks so much, guys. Have a fabulous rest of your day and hopefully see you on the next one.